Sadly, barely a week goes by without another news report of the sad state of public health. It's a crucial issue because everyone is deserving of proper health care, but it's made more complicated by government's plan for a national health insurance. Tonight, we begin our special coverage of our public health care system. The good, the bad, and sometimes the very ugly. The following story contains visuals that may be upsetting to sensitive viewers. Our emergency medicine doctors are rated among the best in the world, and foreign doctors are literally queuing up to better their skills in our emergency units. Derek, I had the privilege of seeing that reason for firsthand when I spent a night with a courageous team at the Mitchells Plain Emergency Centre. Today is a Saturday evening. Um, I'm doing a night shift at Mitchell's Plain. It's about seven o'clock now. They shot you. So I need some food. It's month end and trauma centers around the country are bracing themselves for whatever society can throw at them. Car accidents, stab victims, heart attacks. We are going to spend a Saturday night in Cape Town's busiest emergency center, Mitchell's Plain. It's an area notorious for drive-by shootings, gang battles and violence. We're anxious about what lies ahead. Having started his community service at the beginning of the pandemic, Dr. Abu Bakr de Villiers has now qualified. Preparing for the sheer intensity of what's to come, he pauses to listen to music for 10 minutes. Barely through the door, he's confronted by his first emergency, one of several assault victims he'll see tonight. Hello, what's your name? Hey. What happened to you? Dr. Katya Evans, specialist emergency physician, is the consultant on call, providing backup to the team on duty. The shift is just starting and already there are 80 patients waiting. Back lesions, assault, uh, body pains. Within minutes, the first medical emergency is wheeled in. So um, this gentleman has had um, some sort of neurological event. It's either a um, stroke or a seizure. If he deteriorates further, then um, he will need a CT scan of his brain. Dr. Priscilla Ohm is in charge tonight. Apart from Dr. De Villiers, she's working with a young and inexperienced team, two community service doctors and two visiting German students on duty for the first time. Despite that, she's focused and calm. Did it come loose? You have people that have been waiting five to six hours, maybe 10 to 12 hours even in our units, still fairly sick, needing to be here, but the patients that are getting rolled in are dying now. So I think that kind of balance, that continuous work, um, and you feel like you're never really catching up. He's gonna have a vein there. As the health system across the country takes strain, people come to emergency centers like this one to access help because they know that nobody gets turned away. That means that the load on healthcare workers just keeps getting heavier and heavier. 5,000 patients a month are treated here with trauma cases like knife and gunshot wounds accounting for just 15%. Still exhausted from dealing with the worst of COVID, emergency staff are now struggling with rising caseloads. So there's a lot of chronic diseases that were neglected and now the long-term sort of complications of those. The cancers with delayed diagnosis um, picked up, you know, when the patients are very advanced or metastatic disease and patients have got very complicated disease. And many of them, the terminally ill, arrive here, taking their place alongside trauma patients. We're worried, you're very yeah. sick. We're gonna have a chat to your daughter as well, but you're gonna have to sleep in hospital, okay? But not on this hard bed. We're gonna move you upstairs to a comfortable bed in the ward, okay? Providing end-of-life care in an emergency ward is unexpected, but something Dr. Evans is passionate about. 
if we see how many of our patients are terminally ill, um, we can care for them in a better way, provide them with uh, medications or treatment to keep them comfortable in their last moments, how to provide dignity and respect and comfort in someone's uh, dying moments in an environment that is not necessarily su suited to that. It feels like we're on the edge of a battle zone. Bloodied, punctured survivors wheeled in at high speed. Nine stab victims and counting, with the less critical propped up along the passage. And it's only 12.30. They're assessed, patched up, and quickly dispatched from the resuscitation area, making room for the next arrivals, who keep on coming. What happened to you? Yeah. They stabbed you. OK. Come on. Uh -huh. Can we get him dress? It's very wet. Uh -huh. There's a problem. Your lung is collapsed because they stabbed you in the back, okay? I need to put a pipe into your chest so that your lung can expand again, okay? Yeah, we are, we are the Briaga blankets. Is that coming? Can I please put the blood pressure cuff back on this side? Yes, yes, yes. These doctors have been on the go non-stop. One patient every seven minutes in this emergency centre here in Mitchell's Green. It's unbelievable that their energy levels are as high as they are still after all these hours. This patient is deteriorating. Okay. He needs a CAT scan and must be transferred as soon as they can get an ambulance. While they wait, amid the surrounding bustle, Dr. Evans stops everything and ensures his mother has a moment with her son. So these are not just medical professionals, they're good humans. They understand that this is the patient's worst moment and they are there to help them. And that level of compassion, um, I actually have no words to describe it. People often picture doctors as being the lifesavers, but often people do die. Um, and that aftercare with the family is also part of our job, but it's a highly neglected portion of our job, especially in the EC, because someone dying right now is obviously takes priority over someone who has already passed away. Um, so that kind of balance, I think, is always a bit challenging, yeah. As the night wears on, more inebriated assault victims arrive. Sister Mans, head nurse for the emergency unit tonight, intervenes. The worst happens on a weekend, yeah. when patients are intoxicated and the family also. So obviously they, they, they push them in here, demanding to be helped first, forgetting that we have other patients inside here. It's really tricky. We've had a lot of threats against our doctors. We've had physical assaults. Um, we've had two doctors that have been very badly injured and assaulted. A lot of threats that they're going to be followed home after the end of shift. Something Sister Mans knows all too well, and it's not only violence she has to contend with. Our shift started at 7. We had a patient on CPAP, so I need to go to the loo now and have some water to drink. We haven't had it at the lunch break. But the break is not to be. As she turns away, the next stab victim is rushed in. To the untrained eye, like mine, it looks quite chaotic watching the staff treat one emergency and then move on to the next crisis. But it's very much like a pit stop in Formula One. Everyone has a role to play and time is of the essence. There is a system and it works. It's 5.30 and there's no letting up. Fatigue inevitably sets in. It is a struggle, but I think it's a global struggle. All doctors work long shifts. Feel the burn? I want you to see if it's straight. Push this way. Sorry. Great. Does the bone feel smooth to you? Uh -uh. When patients are admitted under the influence of drugs, they become violent and delusional. There's a two-year waiting list of foreign students wanting to volunteer here because we're renowned for having the world's toughest trauma units. Yet there's still a shortage of emergency doctors because the job's extreme pressure takes a toll. They're burning out or leaving. So what impact does this have on you having to work at this pace non-stop? 
it can break you down. Um, a lot of our, our doctors are struggling um, with moral injury because um, you may be at times not providing the care that are in line with your um, principles and what you want to provide. We have a lot more absenteeism from uh, mental health, sick leave or sick leave of other reasons. And it's very different to what it was a few years ago when it comes to staff burnout and um, depression. And the workforce is young, mostly community service doctors and newly qualified medical officers. 65% of their shifts are after hours, isolating them socially. No matter how dedicated, they only last a couple of years, leaving very few senior emergency medicine specialists in the system. I went through a bout of uh, burnout. Uh, towards the end of my community service and I took off uh, two months just to try and f figure things out and find myself and try and recover from what had been a crazy year um, in the emergency unit during the peak of the COVID pandemic. Dawn finally breaks. It's the home stretch and the nursing staff are changing shift. Very, very busy shift. We had lots of trauma patients, about 11 stabs. Most of our patients were intoxicated, but the teamwork was there. But the doctors have two and a half hours to go, and the paperwork is endless. This patient is still being patched up eight hours later. An x-ray shows his hand is fractured, and Dr. de Villiers is concerned about the depression in his skull, which will need a CAT scan. Are you able to leave work here, like mentally, so when you walk away, you walk away from all the things that we've seen this evening? So for the most part, yes, but there are those cases. You go home and you think about it. For me, it's usually deaths involving young people, so pediatric deaths or adolescent deaths. This weekend, 424 patients have come through this unit, 62% of them critical with five deaths, none of them on our shift. We emerge 14 hours later. The doctors make a point of going off shift together, never leaving anyone behind. As we leave one door, five critical patients are entering another. For now though, it's over, but they'll be back in just 10 hours to do it all again. It's funny how calm everything looks once the morning starts. <laughs> it's like the night didn't happen. I think I was most appreciative that no one died yesterday. Um, it's not every day that you get a shift that you don't have to break bad news. So yeah, it was a pretty good shift. Thank you for watching our stories here online and please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.